it's always iffy if you're talking in the last session of the conference, you know. So I'm glad so many people are here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, anomaly detection and root cause analysis. And the particular case study that I'll talk about, it's uh, based on data from a mobile 4G network. So here's an outline, some motivation, overview, then I'll talk about the actual case study and then summarize. Um, I'm going to try to allow enough time for questions at the end, but if you have something, you, you can ask me while I'm talking. It's not such a large group, uh, so feel free to ask me something. So what's the motivation? Um, the idea is that, you know, if we can detect problems in a network uh, proactively, uh, then maybe there's time to do something, fix it, so that we don't have a big problem in the network. And we want to use now, like everybody else, we want to use machine learning uh, to do this. And uh, 4G networks, that's the LTE network. I think most of you have geo, so you're all getting service from a 4G network now. Um, and it's, uh, <laughs> It's complex because it has a lot of capabilities. So it has the radio side and then uh, also, you know, the uh, core side where most of the intelligence lies. It generates a lot of data, which is kind of different from earlier networks. Every time you do something on your phone, you know, a lot of, uh, a big record is generated. So there's data from the radio side, handoff data, cell data, some experience indicators. Then on the MME, which is like the real brains in the network, uh, there are other pieces of information uh, generated like signal quality, error codes and so forth. So that's kind of the data we work with. It's large and it's both categorical and numerical. And currently what they do is, uh, it, obviously a lot of things happen now too. The networks work well, uh, but they, the methods tend to be reactive and it's better if we could have more predictive models. So that's our motivation for doing this work. And the approach we've chosen is we want to come up with fast non-parametric methods to detect anomalies. And then once you detect an anomaly, you look at some of the uh, other information that this is generating to infer the root cause. Because if you can't infer the root cause, just detecting the anomaly from the operator's point is not enough. Because they want, they say, well, now, so what? Help us pinpoint the problem. So that's our big motivation for doing this work. And some challenges, I mean, the network is complex. It does generate a lot of data. Uh, the other thing is the customer expectations are high. It, the idea is that the network is always available. And typically telecom networks are very reliable. Uh, I know people, I mean, yeah, maybe your view is that you lose signal but that's often because you're in a building or elevator or something. But the network itself usually is pretty reliable. Um, the other thing is when you had simpler networks, you could use KPIs and said, oh, if you cross a threshold, then maybe you have some problem. But now the problems are more complex, they're more subtle. And so those are not sufficient using KPI methods. Those continue to be used, but there's always uh, other new need for new methods. You know, it's like, I want to know now, before the outage happens, uh, I want to know, you know, I don't want unplanned outages, right? <laughs> so, so the other thing is, uh, these networks are very reliable, they're pretty stable. So there are not many events, um, which is good, but to build a model, we don't have a lot of failure data to build the model. Um, and some small failure events, they're considered normal. By that, I mean that in these large telecom networks, you're not concerned if 
your, one, your call gets dropped, we're not going to do much about it because either you will, <laughs> either you'll retry, redial, or, yeah, <laughs> you'll either re redial or even there'll be some protocol even might try for, to set up a session for you or something. So, but you know, if nobody in this hotel could make a call, then it gets serious. So, that, so the, that's what it, I mean by some failure events are considered normal. Um, so we don't uh, look at every record, basically. And then so these anomalies are rare. And the idea is that some of these small problems, they could be a precursor to a bigger event. So the idea is to detect them and then apply measures based on root causes. Okay, so uh, since I'm going to give a quick overview of anomaly detection. It's really quick, very high level, but just to set the context. So anomaly as a dictionary definition, it's just data, a pattern in the data that doesn't conform, conform to what you would expect. And there are different terms used for this, outliers, ex exceptions, etc. And so they, they should be in a good system, they should be rare in a data set compared to the normal instances. Most of the instance, instances should be normal. And this anomaly detection is actually quite a mature field in terms of theory. Uh, and it's used in many domains, intrusion detection, you know, for where you monitor network traffic uh, to detect uh, security violations. There's network monitoring where you look at network traffic, performance, logs, and that's sort of what uh, I'm focusing on. Then there's fraud detection like credit card fraud where you look for uh, anomalies in spend patterns. Uh, it's also applied to databases and file servers for data leakage. Um, medical applications which are becoming more common now and then there's video surveillance, you know, all the cameras that record videos. Now there are algorithms for, it's too much for a person to stand there to look at it. So there are now algorithms for detecting anomalous uh, uh, behavior in those. So there are many domains where this is used. So, you know, a simple example there, how do you think of it? So if you have some data with just two attributes, you plot them. And then, so you see here, you have a cluster. Uh, and then you would call this like a global outlier. It doesn't belong to any cluster. Here you have a small cluster, but you have some data that's uh, possibly a local outlier because it's close to this cluster. And then, you know, you have another global outlier. So you have many small clusters. Now often a small cluster could be an anomaly. When we use clustering for anomaly detection, we look at the small clusters because we think those are anomalies. Yes. For actually, if, you know, for time series data, there are sort of a lot of established known methods where there are algorithms where you can take a time series and you can separate out the various portions of the, like there'll be some weekly variation, uh, daily variation, uh, like, you know, you'll have less usage at night, more usage in the daytime, those kinds of things. So there are algorithms that will separate out all those things. They'll even be maybe seasonal, you know, you have every quarter, you have some fluctuation. And after all of that is removed, then you'll see if there's some real anomaly. So yeah, it's very typically applied to time series. Yeah, well, I will talk about one, but any data that you collect on an ongoing basis, you can uh, run anomaly detection algorithms on that. Uh, so, you kind of identified what one of 
justify your point and other things. If you think about men as anomalies and men uh, anomalous, you know, some certain things that are anomalous only in certain contexts. Yes, yeah. And I'm just going to give some example that I think that's the next slide. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, Okay, so I'm just going to show some brief examples before I actually get in the case study. So we had some router data for about 60 routers and it was hourly data for one month. So 30 days times 24. Uh, and we didn't know much about the system and it's still, this is hourly data, so it's not very fine, but you can still learn a lot from this. So we took an average for the entire month for each router and we plotted that. So these points that you see, so these are the router numbers and this is the CPU usage percent for each router. And so we've plotted that and then uh, what we see is it's an average of 720 data points, the monthly. And here you see right away that you're seeing a group of routers that have very low average CPU usage and you have a group that has high CPU usage. So this kind of points out the importance of when you're doing any of these kind of projects, first just do basic exploratory data analysis with the data to see what's going on. So right away now you have two groups of routers and now you can see depending what did you want to do with the data, do you want to do capacity planning? Then you would say, well, why do I have these routers that are not being used much? Maybe either, either I remove them or I reroute traffic or something. And then I have these, some of them have some, I mean, this is the average for the month. It's pretty high, right? So that's one thing we did. Then just with the same data, what we did, for each router, we made a box plot. We had 720 points for each router. We created a box plot. And actually, this is a little bit more finer grained than the previous one. And you see actually three groups of routers. One have very low CPU usage. Uh, even their maximum values, their, these whiskers, they are not very high. So these are hardly used. So this is a group then you want to look at what are they doing in the network. Then these have some medium usage and then these blue ones, some of them have very high usage. And if in case you're having problems, then maybe you focus on these. And like when we looked at this data, we said, okay, these routers that have like 100% usage on certain hours, uh, we then went and looked at the log for that router number and that hour of the day. And we went to see what was happening in the system. So that's a kind of, you detect some anomaly, then you go look for some root cause. Of course, this is all manual, but this is something you can do in the beginning to understand your data. So never sort of discount the value of this exploratory analysis. So you were asking about different types of anomalies. So there's point anomalies where you have data and individual points are anomalous. Then there are contextual anomalies where in some context the data is uh, anomalous. You can also think of temperature. Like what's the average temperature these days here? 27, 28. So if suddenly it went up to 40, then that would be an anomaly, right? If tomorrow was 40. While in Delhi, I think these, it's closer to 40. So that would not be an anomaly, right? So there's the context. Um, uh, and then there's a sequence, a collective anomaly, where you see a sequence of events or observations and taken together, they are anomalous. For example, you would see this in a, this is an example from an ECG reading. So there's, and I'll also talk about these uh, sequence, subsequence anomalies. And then there are many methods of anomaly detection. It depends on the kind of data you have, the problem you're trying to solve, whether you have labeled data or unlabeled data. 
and so there, you know, there are classification-based methods that would typically apply to data that's labeled. There's clustering-based, which would often apply to unlabeled data. Uh, you can do statistical analysis for time series data, and it can be parametric or non-parametric. Uh, there's nearest neighbor-based methods. Then there's other methods, one of which is visualization. I've done some work using self-organizing maps and kind of done some visual analytics. I won't be talking about that today, but there are methods, the visualization methods you can use for anomaly detection. Yeah, the, the, so they're all, the, the, then you get into this distance uh, measurement, uh, right? So to summarize, just some challenges for anomaly detection. Uh, before I go too far, if you want to learn about kind of just the basic concepts, um, theory about anomaly detection, this, there's this survey paper, it's very good by Chandola and others. It's a very good survey paper. So one is that you need domain expertise to define what is normal. The way you can detect an anomaly is if you know what's normal and then you measure the deviation from the normal. Um, so there's some context for that. Um, and sometimes the normal behavior, it evolves over time. Things change. So you have to keep measuring normal. Um, and then for things like intrusion detection, uh, the, the people who are doing it, they adapt. So you have to stay a step ahead of them, right? It's like, you know, if you run Microsoft Windows, you're always getting those security updates because something happened, you know? Or like if you have a spam filter for your mail and then for a while you won't get any, hardly any spam, then your spam filter has become old and then you'll get a lot and then so. Um, and then, uh, as I said, the notion of anomaly, it depends on the application domain and the context. There's the big issue of whether you have labeled data or not for training. Often you don't. Uh, and then you have to be careful. You don't want to consider the noise as the anomaly, so you don't want to. And then this boundary between normal and outlying is not very precise. Sometimes it's a, like a spectrum. So these are all sort of typical challenges, which would be uh, vary by uh, domain. Okay, so now I'm going to go into a specific case study we did with real data. So I've already pretty much talked about the network, but the log data that we are using. So here we started with the data. Sometimes if you're building some new theoretical model, you'll build a model, then you'll test it, validate it with some data. But here we are driven with the data. We have to make do with the data that the net network generates. So what we have access to is this, what I call network log data. It's generated on a per procedure basis. Procedure means if you click on your phone for anything, then it's a, some kind of procedure and a big record is generated. Or if there's a handover, like if you're in your car and you're driving, then you'll be transferred from one cell tower to another. So, or when you get off the airplane, you turn your phone on, so you attach to the network. So these are all procedures. And we do get a lot of NAs because depending on the type of procedure, it may not generate all the fields. So the data is not so clean. Um, we are not concerned with one procedure failing. We're interested in system-wide failures, but the data is on a per-procedure basis. That's why I said it's not labeled. Because per-procedure, we will get some error code, whether it was success or failure. Um, very few system-wide failures happen because it's a reliable system. And then also the network behavior changes over time because you have new technologies. You know, there's 3G, 4G, now we're into 5G, so. Um, 
So, so there are not enough failure cases to develop a supervised model. So that's why this work is unsupervised modeling. And we have to deal with the network evolution. So this data is called per call measurement data, uh, PCMD. It's on a per procedure basis. From one machine, like from one MME, we would get like about 700,000 records per minute. Um, and uh, data is not totally clean, many NAs. Uh, okay, I think I covered all of these. So here's our framework. This is what we developed. We developed the methodology for doing formally doing data pre-processing. As most of you know, a lot of time goes in the data prep. Uh, so we did that here. We tried to do it methodically. We First of all, we aggregated the records. So we are getting these records that are generated at millisecond level. And we took chunks of 10 seconds worth of data and we aggregated it. So then we are looking, then basically that becomes one observation. So we are doing some processing with that. In this way we could also reduce the uh, number of NAs. Then we apply PC, we are doing unsupervised anomaly detection, so we apply PCA, principal component analysis, uh, on the, to characterize the normal data. Then we develop the model and then we can apply that to new data that comes in. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to understand how critical that is for this use case that you're solving for network ingestion. Okay. So like I mentioned to you, we are not interested if you a procedure, one observation is in error. So in that sense, we are not losing precision. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. So here, the focus is not on the intrusion detection. It's more on failures in the network, normal failures in the network. There are other methods that are catching what you're talking about. So there can be even network failure where, you know, there can be a spike in the power that is getting something in that, and then it comes down. And in that 10 seconds, it took normal and it's exactly the same. So whether it was... Okay. You lose a little bit something, but let me go through this and then you can ask the question again, you know, if you still have the concern, okay. Um, so once you detect an anomaly, then you go into root cause analysis and what we used for that is in the same record, we have a series of messages available and those are the messages that are uh, executed to uh, do, do the procedure. So one can think of that like a finite state machine. And then we use that to detect anomalous subsequences. Okay, so the first part is the pre-processing of the data. So we aggregate it into 10 seconds. Um, and what we did for categorical features, we generated dummy variables for each category then you compute the relative frequency for of each category. And for numerical features, compute the median value. These are pretty standard methods. Um, then we dropped features that were 100% NAs, or there was not much variation, or they were not very relevant to what we were doing, um, like ID and stuff. Uh, then after that, we still had fair number of NAs in the data. So what we did for categorical features, we replaced that with zero, which means that this happened with zero frequency, which is fair. Uh, it's not. And then for numerical features, 
we replaced it with the mean and since we are doing PCA analysis, it was okay. And then we standardized the data because this is, those variables represent ma many different things. So we standardized it by subtracting the mean for the categorical features and subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation for the numerical features. So this is pretty much. Okay, so uh, you were good till here, right? Im we impute the NS and all. Now you have some data and something could be in milliseconds, something could be in seconds and something could be signal to noise ratio. So that could be a ratio, there could be throughput, so many megabits per second. So very different units and if I want to run some models on this, uh, I won't, I will have problems. So what you do is, these are standard procedures where what you do is, uh, if it's a categorical variable, you subtract the mean, okay. So you then kind of bring the uh, data together and if it's a numerical variable, you subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation for each variable. So then the values are now closed together. Yeah, normalization. What, uh, say that again? The categorical data was already hot encoded, right? It was made into zeros and ones, dummy variable creation. Yeah, I not zeros and ones. Uh, it is, say I have a category right. um, of something and it has five possible values. So in the original data set, it's one variable. And it's going to say that this uh, was red, this was green, yellow. But what I'm going to do in my data set, could you, um, I create five variables, red, green, yellow, blue. And then I count because I remember I aggregated the data for 10 seconds. So I count how many reds I have. So if I have five reds, I'll put there, maybe I have 10 greens. So I put that, so it's not zero one, it's the number, the frequency. Okay, so in, in that case, once it is numbers, uh, why are we not doing uh, standard, uh, dividing by standard deviation for categorical ones? This is standard sort of procedure that you apply to. These are standard methods, I didn't okay. make them up. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Did that answer? There was another question. Did that answer yours? Okay. You're good? Okay. All right. Now we want to do PCA. So first we take the normal data. Uh, we do this pre-processing, which I described. Uh, then we do the standardization or you can call it normalization. And then we run the PCA model um, and then we create a detection model, which I'll show you on the next slide. It's a, and we compute a chi-square statistic. So I've got this model with the normal data. Then when I'll get a target data, I'll do the same thing, same processing, standardization, uh, run the PCA, the principal scores, uh, and then do prediction, okay. Uh, for those who are not familiar with PCA, it's a tool to reduce the dimensionality. So if you have a lot of variables and many of them might be correlated, this will create a few variables that are not correlated. So it's a but you maintain all the information, okay? So it finds the projections that have the largest variations. This is the standard method. So uh, based on, I mean, the we did uh, extensive literature review how to, you know, what to apply it for our problem. And what we found is, and I'll show you in the results, 
that we want to exclude the first few principal components because they capture things that are related to the technology and so forth. We want to drop the last few because they are mostly capturing very little variation, it is mostly noise. So, we are going to use the middle few principal components to detect anomalies because they are time independent. So, we defined, um, we said they must have some range of variation and the specific number we used based on some iterations was they explain at least 2 percent of the variation and not more than 5 percent. For this study, that is what we use. For your study, you would use something different, but it is in that range. Um, so, this is the PCA model. Um, and there is a paper that had already used a model like this. The thing that we did different is we are not using the first two principal components, we are using the middle principal components, three and four. So, what you do is, so here is this, you select the components that satisfy this variance uh, uh, limits, then you derive this chi-square statistic where this is the principal component yij and this is the variance, the sample variance for that component and then you say this ith observation is an anomaly if this value is greater than the chi-square value that you would see from a table and alpha is the significance level and m is the number of middle principal components. In this particular study that m is 2, we tried different alpha values, you know typically 0 0.05, 0 0.025 so forth and the results were pretty consistent. So, I will only present one set. And for the root cause analysis, so once you have the anomaly, I have these message messages. So, I would have a sequence of messages, maximum 20 because that is the buffer size that is allocated for it. Um, and I would look at these. So, what we see is a number and this number has a meaning. It tells you num message number 20 is this. Also, with every sequence, we will have a, we will know whether it was a success or a failure. So, we, we analyze these subsequent and sequences and find subsequences that are anomalous. And the way we do that is with your, with the normal data, we uh, came up with, there were some few hundred unique message sequences and we extracted those that always resulted in success. And then we created a like a probability transition matrix with that, meaning if you have this message, if you ex executed message 20, what is the probability of now have the next message being 31 or whatever. Um, so, we created this matrix. So, when we get the anomaly data, we again look at the dominant failure message patterns and we identify the abnormal sequences, subsequences and then with associated with that, we have some other fields in the data that give the error codes. And that these two things combined, the subsequence and the error codes kind of quite finely pinpoints the cause of the problem. Okay, since we are a little bit low on time, I am going to jump to the results. So, uh, the data is like I said about 250 fields. It has information on various things that would be of interest in a wireless network. Um, and we had a lot of normal data. We had normal data for three different years, not for the whole year, but we selected times from that. And we had outage data from these two years. So, we had outage, two outage data. Okay. So, we took the normal data and we uh, plotted PC1 against PC2 and what we found is, as I mentioned, the first principal components, they are very, they represent time dependent characteristics because what they are doing is, 
So this is 2014 data, this is 2015, and this is 2017. So this clearly tells me this is not going to be so good for anomaly detection, and that was our suspicion. Um, when we looked at the PC3 and PC4, we found just for the normal data, we didn't see any time grouping. It's more random, so you don't see any pattern. So this led us to believe this is time, in, they're representing time independent characteristics. So this was normal data. Now, now we took PC3 and PC4, uh, the middle principal components, and we plotted all the data, normal as well as for the two outages, and we see that the outages are, you know, they are sort of distributed separately, the red and the purple, the green is the normal. There's some overlap, but here you can see that it's separating out. And then we applied this detection model that I described to the third and fourth principal component. Um, just for information, you, when you run a, uh, do principal component analysis, you can also see, the, get the names of the variables that are explaining the variation. And so you get, you can generate these kinds of plots. So if I look at this just quickly, I would say, okay, procedure duration is an important variable. Uh, network throughput is, and there'll be number of variables. We just lump them here uh, that represent network throughput. And so th uh, these would kind of stand out. So you can also do this, you get this information. Because this is good for explaining to your client because they'll ask, well, so what? Because PCA, a principal component is abstract now. So then it's important to show them this because they can relate to this. So here are the results. The way to read these is this red line is the critical chi-square line based on the degrees of freedom and alpha level. Uh, so it's a little bit less than nine, uh, than 10. This is the normal data. And you see that most of the normal data falls below the chi-square. So it's, it's classifying it as normal. The, we had two outages. They were of very different characteristics, um, but it was known that the first one or two minutes was good data, and then we had the outage. So most of the so most of the data is above the chi-square line, except in the beginning, which as we expected. And the second outage was kind of quite long, and it was complex. But again, you see that after first few minutes, most of the data is above the chi-square. So, uh, so the model is validated, we trained it, and it's validated with the two outages. I know if you were doing this, um, like I could not submit this kind of paper to KDD or something, because they'll say you don't have enough data, enough outage data. But in our business, we don't have that many outages. So the, for our internal purposes, this was good enough. Uh, and then, then we created the message patterns. Um, this was the first outage, and we looked at the ratio of 100% success patterns. So in the beginning, um, this outage occurred after one minute which would represent, you know, like six time intervals. Remember we took six, 10 second windows. And so we had high success rate. But after that, there was an abrupt it, uh, drop because there was an outage and so you see, and then slowly the system is recovering. So you're getting better. And here we then identified the subsequences like here, we're saying, you know, these two messages, this message shouldn't happen after this one. So, and then we get the error codes and the error codes, you know, you look in the manual and they have a particular meaning in that uh, context. So, and this is the second outage, which was actually more complex 
there's much more data. And here again, you can see the red sequences that are anomalous. So, and these messages, you can read what they mean. So, they will give you an indication which element in the network was involved. And then these error codes, you can read and it'll tell you, you had a problem at this node. So, this basically summarizes the results. Here's a summary of the case study where we did PC, we did data processing, uh, used PCA, and then uh, did root cause analysis. And uh, just to summarize, so uh, anomaly detection, I mean, though there's a lot of theory on it, in for your own context, when you start doing it, it's quite messy. Um, it really does require strong domain expertise. So in our case, when we first got access to this data, we were very excited because we said now we can do all kinds of things. We can get uh, close to a million records every minute and we can get so much of data uh, and we'll just put it in, just throw it in, right? I'll run random forest, I'll do this, that. And we were not getting anywhere. And uh, then we talked to the people, I mean, people who build these machines, people who do uh, field support, troubleshooting. Actually, we were working with him. And then he said, uh, we did all the exploratory analysis. We showed them, you know, this data looks like this and that. And they said, yeah, that's fine. Then this person told us, don't look at all 250 variables. Why don't you focus on a few things? Our job is to improve the network reliability. Why don't you look at the error codes? And one key information he gave us, why don't you look at, there's a variable called, remember I showed you duration. It's the time it takes to set up the procedure. So if you think of it just logically, if you have a computer and it's taking longer than normal to do things, that means it's overloaded or some, you have some loop or something's happening, right? So it would make sense. So then before we did this big analysis to do root cause, we looked only at five variables, procedure duration, those error codes and some other one or two things. And we have another paper, I've listed it at the bottom. It's a published paper. That's a univariate analysis we just looked at procedure duration. We created distributions. Uh, and I mean, we may, it was all very statistically st significant. And we were able to detect with one variable. So if you can find a key variable, and that algorithm, it runs very efficiently. They can actually code it in C, though this work was in R. They can actually code it in C and put it inside the machine. So there's a benefit to coming up with some simple algorithms that run efficiently, because then you can put it right at the source. You don't have to move your data around. So there, you know, so our first kind of discovery came from somebody who doesn't do machine learning or anything. He solves field problems, but he could guide us. So that was good for us. Um, and again, you know, it's important to do, uh, exploratory analysis uh, to understand the data rather than just jumping into building models. And, you know, most data is unbalanced. You seldom have data where the failure events are frequent because then you don't have a very good system, right? Uh, and then um, root cause analysis is very application specific. And so you have to do it for your own domain. Mm. And lastly, as I mentioned, sometimes simple models can give you very good results. So that's all I have. Uh, I'm going to stop there. But when I put the slides up, there are some uh, links to related work and references so that, you know, we didn't just suddenly do this, but there was work that we built on top of. And I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. 
So I won't be so <laughs> arrogant to say I can prevent the outages. Uh, our goal is to uh, be able to, if we can detect them either very quickly or we can detect small events soon so they can do something to prevent the big outages. Yeah, it's not just router data, it's from, it's compiled in what's called a MME. Uh, it's uh, multiple uh, uh, elements in the 4G network and it's all compiled. So it's much more than router data. So it's not a text it's not a text -based. No, 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 it has all these fields. No, no. I'm using log in a generic way. I'm using log as in a generic way. I mean, I'm using it. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Thank you.